um, I welcome all, um, all of you to today's uh, uh, presentation. My name is Brian. I'm a counselor at uh, River Manor, uh, and I've been sober since 2014. That makes me almost uh, six and a half years. Um, before I begin, off, I usually like us to understand what addiction is, because one of the biggest obstacles in helping our loved ones is not knowing what actually addiction means or what it entails. I just want you to bear with me and take an exercise with me and allow me to take you on a journey uh, that you can empathize and maybe understand a bit about uh, addiction. Please take in a big breath and hold it in for as long as you can. Hold it in, don't breathe. So when you start of holding your breath, I'm sure you're listening to me and I'm sure you're probably curious, why is he asking us to hold our breath in? But as we go on, and, and for those of you that are still holding your breath, uh, I commend you, it's quite impressive. It becomes uncomfortable. All you want to do is to breathe. All you want to do is to get that oxygen. And your brain is telling you, I want to breathe. And eventually, you will have to breathe. Now, when you eventually breathe, you don't feel... Um, like you're high or excited, all you're feeling is normal. Now imagine that oxygen cost you money. Imagine it wasn't for free. Imagine you had to buy it. Imagine that that oxygen was sold in the dingiest places and you have a job and you have a family that you care about, but you're really out of breath that you have to go and find that oxygen. And as you even go to find that oxygen, you're not breathing, you're dying, your mind is not stable, you're trying so hard to breathe and you cannot find that breath. And eventually when you breathe, what happens is you want more breath and that's normal. And that's how our addicted population feel like. Why it is like that, I cannot explain. But when you're addicted to any substance, you just get caught up in the fighting to find more so that you can feel normal. And if all of us can empathize and feel that out of breath feeling that we just felt, maybe we can understand what our, our uh, family and loved ones go through. They have to experience that. And it's not that they don't love and care or they don't uh, treasure their jobs and their roles and the different things that they have to do, but addiction or substances or that path of life becomes the only normality that they know. And it's quite, uh, quite complicated. If you have taken in a breath, initially it was okay, it was comforting, and then it became uncomfortable, and then eventually you had to eventually breathe. Unfortunately, or fortunately for us, breath is free and that's how it is for addicts. So that brings us to a question. What is addiction? Unfortunately, if you ask clients, if you ask uh, anyone, addiction is the most misunderstood disease or misunderstood concept. Doctors have a different theory. Uh, lawyers have different theories, nurses have different theories, the communities that we stay in, everyone seems to have an idea. But let's look at the statements. Is addiction a matter of choice? Is addiction physiological dependence? Or is addiction, sorry, a brain disease? Because these are some of the answers you will find as you try to find out what is addiction. So we have an understanding. Is it a matter of choice? Is it physiological dependence? Or is it a brain disease? Okay. 
try to think of an answer and maybe we can have this discussion at the end of, of, of this uh, presentation. Next slide, Cheryl. If none of these fully felt accurate for you, then you have a slight understanding of what addiction might be. Because these are the three myths we face or we experience as people that are addicted and as people that support addicted, um, uh, our addicted community. And I'm hoping that in this session, we may be able to debuke these myths and we will see how we can look at differently addiction, how we can look at addiction differently because how we look at addiction and how we define addiction determines the care and support and guidance that we give our family members. If I think addiction is a myth, if I, did, if I think addiction is a disease, a brain disease, then it means my treatment plan will be focused on dealing with the brain aspect. If I think addiction is a moral failure, then I, it means I'll focus on that. So how we define addiction determines the care and support that we give our loved ones. So let us look at myth number one. Addiction is sorry a matter of choice. Is it? Yes. A level of choice is involved, but unfortunately this model puts all the burden on the individual and forgets to consider how social status and context play a significant role in addiction. This is what they call the moral model. Therefore, if I think my person or my child or my daughter or my wife or whatever it is, is addicted and it's because they have, low, uh, they have no willpower or they made bad choices or they lack willpower. And this is indicative of what initially in the USA in the 80s, one of the uh, famous first ladies had this campaign that targeted drug addiction. Um, and the campaign went under the slogan of just say no campaign. And they went out to punish people that were addicted because they thought, well, they can just say no because it's a choice. This uh, model is non-functional because it aims at uh, punishing if I'm immorally right, then I don't fit in. If I'm immorally right, then I've done some wrong choices. It aims to make... Uh, it makes the person that is addicted feel like he is not human enough and therefore he has made bad choices. So is it a matter of choice? Yes, but it's only a matter of choice if it takes into consideration the social status and social context and everything else that contributes to our people being addicted. Okay, now myth number two. Addiction is sorry, a physiological dependence. So what this uh, model seeks to take the burden off of choice, but highlights that because I'm addicted to something, it's my body and it has nothing to do with my brain. It's just that I have to have it so that I do not get sick. While it is true, continued use leads to dependence, even despite harmful effects. This is not the whole story. In order for me to have the whole story, I must consider the social context, I must consider my choice, I must consider uh, the physiological. If it was only a physiological aspect, then it means that people would only go to rehab, get detox, and then move on and get well. But over time and over experience, we've understood that detox is not part of is not part of the whole picture. Yes, it is, but it's just the stepping uh, step in the right direction. A person has to go through detox so that they don't have withdrawals, so that they do not have body failure where, uh, for example, if you're going through alcohol de detoxification, it's important for you to go through that. Otherwise, the impact of you not going through that is you might have a heart failure or whatever it is. So is it physiological? Yes, but if I say it's physiological, then it means I'm only focusing on getting the person on detox and that's all. But we all know or we hope that we understand that if I take a person into rehab, that's just the beginning and it's not the whole entire process. Myth number three. 
So I sh I'm certain and I'm, I'm sure that some of us have heard that uh, it's addiction is a brain disease, okay? Is it a brain disease? Let's see. So the brain concept, obviously what we're seeing is, yes, there is the brain involved. But when I say it's the brain disease, it means that I only need to focus on the brain and everything else will be okay. So it means I move the detox, I don't take care of the detox, and I do not take care of the psych psychological aspect of the addiction. So this model focuses mainly on the biology of the brain, neglecting the environmental and social forces. This model does not address the work that the patient needs to do in order to change their behaviors or to get back into healthy routine. We know that unfortunately addiction is a relapsing disease. And the only way we mitigate that, uh, that relapse aspect of addiction is by continued behavioral change, by coming um, out of rehab and getting integrated through phases and getting support groups such as NA and AA. And in that way, what that means is that, yes, my brain has been taken care of, but I need to continuously keep my sobriety by participating in it and doing other things. Uh, one of the doctors, uh, Dr. Carl Hart, a professor of neuroscience and psychology at Columbia, once said that if if addiction was a brain disease, then it wouldn't exist because doctors work day and night, find medications for a lot of things, and they would have already found medication that would uh, directly deal with the brain so that a person would not be addicted. So we've looked at physiological, we've looked at the brain disease, and we've looked at the choice. Okay? So I want us to all to look at the picture. Picture, there's a, a patient, I think uh, he's putting on, uh, you know, he's in a hospital. The family is happy. The doctor is doing all that they have to do. What comes to your mind when you think of, when you see this picture? What could, what could the client or this client be suffering from? Probably just came out of an operation, probably cancer. None of us, when we see this picture, think of this as an addicted human being. Addiction is the most prejudiced disease that it not only prejudices the disease itself, but also the clients get prejudiced. That's why we have labels in addiction. And also the treatment itself has a lot of prejudice where uh, people are not happy to go to rehab because of all of that. So in our mind, first and foremost, we need to understand and think of addiction as a disease, like any other disease you can think of. It is a disease. This person in the picture could be suffering from addiction. What does the this addiction disease model say? So all the statements that we talked about initially are true but none of them works inherently as a one, um, as a one uh, aspect. We have to combine all those statements, the physiological, um, the brain aspect, and uh, the choice aspect to create what we call uh, the biological, psychosocial, economic, and spiritual dimension of the disease. Uh, process. This has turned out to be the most incredible uh, program when it comes to treating addictions because it not only focuses on one aspect, it encompasses all the aspects of a disease and in therefore giving our clients a holistic approach that allows them to get better and get well and become not only um, functional adults in society, but also to become better individuals. And when I say better, I mean behavioral change aspects of their life. When people come to us, uh, one of the things that they will say, and I think we we'll always laugh with the whole team is, I want my old life back. Um, that is usually not ideal because recovery means change and change doesn't mean going back to the past. Yes, you can have some aspects of your past, but it's mostly about you paving a new way of life, moving you forward. And that means, how do I treat people? How do I treat myself? How do I deal with people? And 
with this biopsychosocial aspect, it encompasses all the different aspects. So let's go back to the word disease, right? And our client that we saw uh, initially, okay? So initially, we experienced this man, and we were dealing, not sure what he's suffering from. When I talk about a disease of addiction on this man, I hope that it makes sense for you. I hope that you can understand that addiction is a disease like any other. So I'm going to make a comparison between um, if you have a disease of addiction or you have um, let's say, diabetes. Let's see how similar they are, okay? Slide number 16. Yes. Okay, so addiction, on one side we have addiction, let's say our family member is suffering from alcohol addiction, okay? So it is treatable in nature, the same as diabetes or high blood pressure. It requires healthy living. Healthy living means coping my way forward through uh, maybe watching what I eat, watching how I, I, my routine, my structure. Sometimes it requires medication because some of our clients have dual diagnosis. Or sometimes the medication takes a while for people to help them detox. Uh, it requires monitoring. This monitoring happens in different aspects. It also requires follow-up. So we can see here that there's a direct link on all diseases, if it's addiction or if it's high blood pressure or diabetes, okay? I hope that this makes sense and clears up the picture that yes, addiction is a disease, same as um, diabetes or high blood pressure. Um, slide number 15, Cheryl. Okay, so our model focuses on the fact that addiction is a chronic, treatable medical condition. This is a comprehensive model that allows for a biopsychosocial treatment that focuses on all aspects of the disease model. Like diabetes, it is treatable and it is manageable. And that's very important to note because some of us, when our family members come into treatment, we feel very hopeless. We feel like, this is it. I don't think we'll ever get our, our person back. I don't think we'll ever get our child, our, lo our loved ones back in a healthy manner. And they're saying it is treatable and manageable. Okay. How is it treated? How can addiction be treated? And that's very important. And I think that's the reason why uh, most of, of you send your family members and send your loved ones to us so that we can help treat it. Yes, it is treatable even though it's not simple. Addiction is the only disease that no matter how much you support me in my recovery, I need to participate. I need to do the work. When we looked at the client in the hospital, he was laid down, he was being taken care of, he probably didn't have to do anything. But with addiction, the onus and the responsibility is on the clients, is on your loved ones, is on our loved ones, is on me. I have to participate. I don't have to be a spectator in my recovery. So yes, there is a responsibility. And because of my addiction life and because of what I've gone through as a result of my using, I hardly sometimes understand the word responsibility. And that's where the hardships come in, that I want to change, but I'm not willing to do the work. And when you send your, par uh, your family and your loved ones to us, we help support them to move forward by holding them accountable, by supporting them in their progress, and by looking at uh, things that need to change in them, and also guide them. Uh, because addiction is a, is a chronic disease, people can't, stop, can't simply stop using drugs for a few days and be cured. That's very important. That if I stop using for three months, six months, one year, I'm not cured. 
I need long-term and repeated care to stop using completely and recover my life back. So it's an ongoing process. Today I'm sober. If I do not do the things that have allowed me to stay sober for six years, I will go back. And I'm not guaranteed if I'll survive my relapse or if I will even have an opportunity to come back into treatment because what happens if I go back and then I, you know, I mess up my brain ability to learn things or I ruin all my opportunities. Or I, so there's always an impact that it's very important for us to understand the, the value of long-term continuum care because sometimes the risk and the choices we make initially cannot be undone. If I decide to pick up a drink today, the, the choice that I've made is, will I be able to bounce back? That's uncertain. Addiction doesn't care if, if people care for me, if they love me and support my recovery, it doesn't care, unfortunately. So I want us to understand that, that stopping is not what it's about. It's about continued stopping, continued stopped. Uh, addiction treatment must help a person to do the following. So what we usually help our clients is initially to stop using drugs. When they come in, we've created a safe space. We've created very safe spaces at, at all our facilities. We try to make sure that there is no access to drugs. That's the first point. Detox, no drugs to access. And what that happens is it, as time goes on, it clears their mind and there's ability to make judgments and choices and safety. We create a safety net. That's the first step. And then we create a stay drug free lifestyle. A stay drug free lifestyle means that I learn to cope with life and therefore I never have to go back. I learn healthy ways and healthy tools to deal with um, my challenges and my situation because at the end of the day, um, drugs and alcohol are just a symptom. So we create a space where they come in, be helped to not use drugs, and then work through the causes, work through the core problems and challenges that they face. And also eventually every uh, hope and dream for our client is that they may be able to go back into their communities and be productive in family, at work, in society. And this is the integration phase. The integration currently happens at our halfway houses where people are able to, to, to stay in a recovery environment, but also at the same time participate in a functional lifestyle, participate in taking care of their own responsibilities. And some of our clients have work and some so it's an ongoing process. Even then, after they've integrated, they get an opportunity uh, with our outpatient programs to keep coming back because it takes time. It takes time to undo all the damage. It takes time to, you know, be able to experience all my triggers without having to revert to my old ways. Okay. Uh, so. And I think uh, the big, one of the biggest debates that, that, in, that exist are uh, what are the treatments for drug addiction when, client, when uh, family members send people to us, what do we do, what, how do we support them? So what we do, and this is mainly what we have, uh, especially with the successful cases, the ones that follow, all the suggestions that are given by a therapeutic team. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the behavioral counseling and that is uh, administered or that is conducted by our team of, of therapists that come with from different backgrounds and different uh, experiences and come together and what that does is it allows what we call behavioral modification uh, now we are not dealing with the substance itself we are dealing with the behaviors, what behaviors lead me to feeling a certain way and I'm unable to cope with how I feel, so I revert to the drugs or the alcohol to numb the feelings. That's the behavioral counseling and that's changing behavior and targeting, okay, so if you are an angry guy, how do we help you to experience triggers that cause you anger without the drug? Um, and then obviously we have uh, medication, the medication side, the science side of uh, treatment, which involves doctors and psychiatrists and nurses. And, and this is all, all these people are 
playing a part in the biopsychosocial model that we talked about initially. Um, then we have evaluation and treatment for co co-occurring mental health issues such as depression and anxiety. And that's where the psychiatrists and psychologists come in because unfortunately some of our clients and most of our clients always have, not always, but sometimes have underlying dual diagnosis issues that also need to be contained. Um, and then we have long-term follow-up to prevent relapse, what we call the extended care options. Um, some people come in weekly, some people come in bi-weekly, but it's all to make sure that a person is able to stay stopped for over a while. Uh, one of the research that was done uh, by the Harvard University of Addiction Studies says that uh, people that stay sober for a long time, and long time, I mean 20 years, means they've uh, created a lifestyle conducive to sobriety. If someone knows two weeks out of treatment, they have to go back and see the psychologist. There's that responsibility that I need to stay sober for that meeting, or I need to stay sober. If someone's, uh, I need to stay sober so that I can go and see my friends, people that are also trying to get well. And these are some of the long term follow up that we try to, pre to put in place in order to avoid relapses. Also, we have personalized care treatment programs that are. Uh, if obviously depending on the on uh, on our clients, we always try to make sure that no one is left out because we believe also one side doesn't fit all. So we try to tailor make our treatment plans for some individuals. That's mostly if they have done the primary, and they've done the secondary, and they've done the tertiary. You might find that someone maybe is all over the country or is traveling. We can always arrange uh, tailored treatment programs and follow up. Uh, uh, and follow up uh, projects, so yeah, that can be helpful to success. So, in conclusion, I want us to understand foremost things, or some some things basic understanding is when you're addicted, you're willing to do anything to get your drug. It's not because of a moral failure. It's not because physiological. I try to. Uh, uh, put you in the addict's shoes by holding your breath in, I'm sure most of us would do anything to get that oxygen. Addiction is a treatable disease. Understanding addiction equips us better to deal with our loved ones. How I define addiction determines the care I give to my client. Drug addiction can be treated even though it's not simple. Addiction, addiction treatment must have the following objectives someone to stop using, that is mostly usually through detox, to stay drug free. And when I say stay drug free, not for two months or two or three months, long term, be productive in the family and at work and back in society. So um, I don't know if Cheryl, you have anything to add? Um, Thanks, Brian. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think it was it was such a nice way to um, start understanding what addiction actually is. And the one thing that I did want to pick up on, um, if I may, and I think it's one of the two or three. Um, just looking for that slide where you spoke about abstinence. Um, yeah. yeah. I think one of the, the big issues that we find with most of our recovery population, mm. um, firstly, there's some resistance to going onto psychiatric medication if it's necessary, um, because sometimes there's been issues in the past, in, you know, in previous recoveries, um, problems with doctors, um, abuse of pharmaceuticals and you know we tend to focus on the narcotic what is the drug the person is addicted to mm. and then we become a little bit blasé around other drugs so when we talk abstinence and drug free we talk abstinence from all mood and mind altering drugs that would require a detox to come off mm. And our, probably one 
of our biggest struggles is our clients, patients, and families don't often see alcohol as a drug. They also don't see the common over-the-counter medications, or what we call OTCs, um, and that as being part of the problem. So we push it hard and long and repetitively in treatment, what abstinence is. But it's so interesting that when a client and patient leaves treatment, even if it's after three months or six months in a halfway house, if they get sick, they just want to take anything to feel better. And doctors can be part of the problem. Not every doctor really understands addiction as a brain disease. I had an incident a couple of years ago where one of my patients was going for an anesthetic and he really took his recovery seriously. And he phoned me from, from the theater and he had the anesthetist with him. And the anesthetist said, no, it's my obligation to give him pethidine. And I said, but what has the patient asked for? And he said, no, he wants Panado. So I said, well, please honor the patient. He is in recovery. And he said, yes, but, but what drug was he addicted to? So I said, well, not that it matters, but his drug of choice was alcohol and cocaine. And, but he's in the 12-step program of total abstinence. And the anesthetist, who's a very smart guy, said, um, well, if he didn't, wasn't addicted to codeine or, or pethidine, um, I think he should be fine having a pethidine injection. And the, the patient said to him, look, if you're going to do that, please leave. Um, I've worked really hard to stay sober. I've seen so many people fall by picking up one or two drugs and it may not be our drug of choice, but we have the disease of addiction and we don't, we can't discern the difference between different drugs. And it's important that us as family members start wrapping our heads around what abstinence actually is because it's from the drugs and alcohol, it's from pharmaceuticals, but it's also, we have to learn how to abstain from codependent behavior. We have to learn to abstain from control. We have to learn how to abstain from dictating their life. We have to abstain from enabling. So it's, the abstinence is rounded. It comes from different angles at different depths, different faces. And if we expect the loved one, the addict, alcoholic, to be abstinent, but we don't abstain from our codependent behavior, then we're also not helping the biopsychosocial illness. And how we help that biopsychosocial illness is piggyback on what they've learned in treatment. How do... How, do, how does the treatment team handle them? Mm. And we've had it also many times where a family member would come and say, oh, no, no, we're paying a lot of money. Why are they sweeping the passage? <sighs> so because sweeping the passage is taking responsibility. We hope that when they're at home, they're doing a few chores because chores mm. teaches them how to stay focused, stay grounded and, and, res and responsible. I had a patient who many years ago, um, in outpatient, his consequence because he came late was to wash all the dishes, so like 30 or 40 coffee cups. And he said, hey, excuse me, I have a domestic at home and I'll bring her tomorrow night and she'll wash the dishes. And I said to him, no, you won't. Um, she's not dying from this disease, you are. You will learn to wash dishes. And he threw a hissy fit. He's now 17 years sober. And he still attributes, he said, you, you made me wash the dishes. And that was my first step in taking responsibility. And today when I struggle, I go and wash my dishes. <laughs> so something he learned in treatment, as simple as washing the dishes, is one of the mechanisms that he uses now in long-term sobriety. So please learn everything you can mm. to find out about abstinence. Ask questions, uh, email the team, phone the, the rehab, our staff, our, our admin staff, know what abstinence is. If my God had to answer the phone and you say, my son would like to have um, a stow pain for his headache, my God is going to say to you, uh-uh, that's a relapse. 
please don't give it to him. Rather try a Panado or a, a MyPaid and please go to the doctor and please find a doctor that understands addiction because not every doctor, with all due respect to, to our esteemed colleagues, they don't understand what addiction actually means. They often see it as if they stop taking the substance, they're going to be better. Or if we put you on certain medications, then your desire to use is going to lift. But it needs to be a holistic program. Otherwise, there is no the desire to, to use continues because they haven't taken enough responsibility. They may not have worked through the trauma and they haven't yet learned a new language. And that's really what recovery is. It's a new language of how I'm responsible to take care of myself. My mom and dad aren't responsible for me. My husband, my wife, um, my doctor, my therapist, they're there to support me. But it's my responsibility to work. They sat in treatment. They heard everything we have to teach. So we can't, you, we can't keep them sober. The family can't keep them, can't keep them sober. But their job is to stay stopped. So please, if you realize that your loved one has um, cross-addicted in the past, please raise it with the therapist when they make contact with you. It's something then that we can start working on with your loved ones. And please, um, from a changes perspective, we ask that you keep a sober house when they come out of treatment um, for as long as is humanly possible. And if you can't, and if you struggle, then you've got to look at your own relationship with alcohol. Because um, Brian used the example of diabetes, and I used the example of um, skin cancer. If we were told that our loved one had skin cancer and they would die if we didn't do the following things, which is bry at night, darken our windows, go for regular checkups, have some chemotherapy, and wear sunscreen when out. We would make sure that our loved ones, we won't bry on a Sunday afternoon because we feel like it, we know that they could mm -hmm. die from this, so we would bright at night, we would close um, all the, the, the light in, in, in the house, we would buy the sunblock, we would encourage, support, mm -hmm. educate mm -hmm. them to take care of this disease. And it's our responsibility to also educate ourselves. We can't stop them from relapsing, but we shouldn't contribute to it by... Um, not understanding what this disease means. And we ask that you please keep coming back to this forum. Every week you will learn something that is important, something that is um, powerful and supporting each other. You will understand that we get better. Families get better, the addicts get better, and recovery is possible, but it is a long road.